YouTube frogs, welcome to my complete and comprehensive guide to our newest 5-star Hydro Sword user, Nilu. I'll be covering her dual stance talent design in full detail, playstyle and rotation tips, optimal weapons and artifacts, constellations, bloom and non-bloom team comps, and showcasing her gameplay. Let's begin. From Constellation 0 to Constellation 6, Nilu's character design is advertised as a pure HP stacking, bloom enhancing, mixed DPS support. She's the first character introduced that buffs a transformative reaction, bloom, with more than just character level and elemental mastery, adding a conversion of her own HP via passive talent. Her active talents can be broken down as the following. Elemental Skill and Elemental Burst are the focus of her kit. They both scale with HP% percent multipliers and are responsible for both her damage output and Hydra application. Normal Attack Talent is the only attack scaling part of her kit and therefore has no inherent contribution to her general design. Let's dive into her skill and burst. Elemental Skill. This is the most complicated part of her kit, but I will explain all the small details for you guys. Your first activation of her elemental skill, which is E, summons this lotus aura above your head for 10 seconds, activating her transition state and generating 1 to 2 hydro particles. This transition state is called pyroette state. For the next 3 actions, your E and your normal attack are now converted into different abilities and generate 1 hydro particle each. Your elemental skill becomes a whirling step or a water wheel, and your normal attack becomes a sword dance or luminous illusion. All of these attacks from either your E or your left click count as elemental skill damage, so don't worry about the passive from her signature weapon, the key. It will always activate during this transition phase. This also means that full 4P sets like Heart of Depth and Gladiator do not work for any part of her kit. The multipliers for these converted abilities are defined here in her elemental skill. Your third or last action in this transition state determines her elemental skill's second phase, or her stance. Using her elemental skill, your E, as the last action, activates her off-field ability, Tranquility Aura, or Aura Stance, for 12 seconds. This blanket of water surrounds your active character, applying Hydro every 2 seconds, but it deals 0 damage. This blanket of water is able to proc reactions like Bloom or Vaporize, but the reactions themselves deal no damage. The cores produced from Bloom will still deal damage. And while this Aura Stance only reapplies Hydro every 2 seconds, it checks the surrounding for new enemies to apply Hydro once every 0.5 seconds. You can hear this check through audio cues. The standard rotation to enter Aura Stance looks like this. Tap your elemental skill to activate the stance, then you E or normal attack 2 times, and then you E to enter Aura Stance. Slower rotation is E 4 times, while the faster rotation is doing normal attack twice in between the two E's. While the faster rotation does save 0.3 seconds, I prefer E spamming for Aura Stance, as the normal attack can accidentally proc Sword Stance if you don't want it. Using her normal attack, which is your left click, as the last action activates her on-field ability, Lunar Prayer or Sword Stance for 8 seconds. This converts all of her normal attacks to be Sword Dance and Luminous Illusion Hydro-infused attacks, counting as elemental skill damage and using these HP% percent multipliers. During these 8 seconds, Nilo cannot charge attack, so she simply spams her normal attack. She can spam 15 normal attacks during this duration, or 5 full sets of her M3. If you include the first 3 during her transition state, this totals for 18 normal attacks for a total of 141.42% max HP damage at level 6. These Sword Stance attacks follow normal ICD at 30 3 hits per 2.5 seconds. So her entire sword stance rotation looks very simply like this. E into normal attack times 18, or combining each of her normal attack by 3 into N3 combos, we get E into N3 by 6. So both of these stances serve their own purpose. The off-field aura stance is a no damage reaction only ability because it applies hydro specifically at 2 second intervals and can trigger reactions like bloom that deal damage even though the ability inherently cannot deal damage. Aura stance is designed for Nilu created blooms and or just strict hydro application. The on field sword stance is our hydro DPS form and faster hydro applying ability. Following normal ICD rules, Sword Stance applies Hydro 5 times over 15 attacks in an 8 second duration, so this is about once per 1.6 seconds. Usually in running Sword Stance, other characters who apply their element in a normal 2.5 to 3 second fashion will be slower than Nilu's application and will be triggering the reaction. In practice though, you can totally run both of these stances in her playstyle and achieve comfortable results. No matter which stance is selected, Nilu's elemental skill goes on an 18 second cooldown, counting down immediately after the very first activation. This is what that visually looks like for both rotations. So usually it'll take 1 to 2 seconds for the full transition phase, and then 8 to 12 seconds for whatever stance you chose. Aura stance with a 12 second uptime and a 1.2 second transition has a 4 to 5 second effective cooldown. 
Sword Stance with an 8 second uptime and a 1 to 2 second transition has about an 8 to 9 second effective cooldown. Elemental Burst. Nilu deals AoE Hydro damage in a fairly large circle around her, leaving behind a mark that detonates after 2.5 seconds, dealing another instance of single target Hydro damage to enemies marked. The 2.5 second detonation time indicates precise timing for a second application of Hydro to the enemies after the initial cast. That's it. Her burst simply deals damage twice and applies Hydro twice. Her burst does contain her highest single hit multipliers though, at 25.8 and 31.5% max HP, totaling for 57.3% max HP, and does apply Hydro twice, meaning she can double vaporize with this ability. Even though it has an 18 second cooldown and a 70 energy cost, which is relatively high, there's little inherent value to forcing a burst uptime loop, as the bulk of her value comes from her elemental skill. So in my opinion, I'd view Nilu's Burst as an extra ability, and therefore more forgiving on less energy recharge builds. In Bloom situations, it's two more instances of Hydro application, meaning it should be used when her Aura Stance is on cooldown and not active. In non-Bloom situations, it can be used whenever you need a filler ability or an iframe. In DPS situations, it can be used as a generic nuke or time for amplified vaporized damage. Now, those are her active talents broken down. Let's get into her passives where her unique build path comes to life. Her Ascension 1 passive introduces these super blooms with a restriction on team comp elements. If her team is only Hydro and Dendro, and at least one of each, completing her elemental skills transition phase, which is visually shown for both stances here, grants Golden Chalice effect. Golden Chalice is a 30 second duration refreshable effect. Your blooms become super blooms, and Dendro attacks that hit your active character, which is self bloom damage, and grants your team plus 100 elemental mastery. Super blooms have near instant pop time and greater AoE. They cannot proc Hyper Bloom or Virgin. Ascension 4 passive scales her max HP to increasing all of those super blooms created by any team member, not just her, at a rate of 1000 HP above 30k to 90%. So 50,000 HP is 180% and 74,000 HP is 400%. This damage increases additive on top of Elemental Mastery's boost to Bloom damage. So, as an example, my Nilu has 210 Elemental Mastery. This increases Bloom damage by 151.9%. A 50,000 HP Nilu would improve this by 180% to a total of 331.9% increase to Blooms. Now, because Golden Chalice activates only after Nilu enters one of her two stances, the first blooms in your rotation may be normal blooms. You can see in this demo, the first blooms by Barbara and DMC are normal blooms and take much longer to pop in comparison to the super blooms later. And that is the core of Nilu's complex design. I think it's pretty cool. With regards to her talent priority, if you're only focused on super bloom damage from the team, none of these actually matter. If you care about the extra damage from her HP scaling, then elemental skill and elemental burst matter. The normal attack is never used. So for my general recommendation, I'd go elemental skill over elemental burst with the normal attack being useless. Now that her basics have been covered, quick run through of recommended stat thresholds. Now, you may have noticed something different this time around. Usually, I cap out my characters for guides at level 80 due to the material investment being much higher for not that much gain. Nilu is the first exception. She actually needs level 90 for legitimate full value due to base HP being the only, and I mean only stat that truly matters in a long-term general build. Level 90 grants not only base HP difference, but also caps out her HP% percent ascension stat. Just as an example, my Nilu went from 57,000 HP to 65,000 HP, level 80 to level 90, changing absolutely no artifacts. That's a substantial 8,000 HP gain, 15% more at level 90 over level 80. Now, this 65,000 HP is with her signature weapon at level 80, granting an additional 80% total HP percent from the secondary and the passive. Without her signature weapon, you'd expect about 50,000 HP pretty easily. Now, are there any other stats that truly matter? Not really. Energy recharge, it's probably second highest value. It's really good for burst uptime, but burst uptime is not nearly that important for her. If you want to do 20 second rotation bursts though, I would aim for 180% recharge or higher. Otherwise, any extra subtypes are fine, there's no threshold. If you prefer Aura Stance Bloom playstyle, which is the off-field one, Elemental Mastery will be a great substat because she'll be able to double dip from both her HP and extra Elemental Mastery substats for Super Bloom damage, and if you have her key weapon, they will also stack with the key's elemental conversion gain from her HP. If you're running hybrid DPS playstyle, then crit rate and crit damage are viable substats. However, without Constellation 6, 
the total crit rate crit damage from this build, if maximizing strictly HP, will struggle to be consistent. So, in general, all you need to focus on is the HP stat. And I'd recommend at least 50,000 without her signature weapon. And if you have her signature weapon, then above 60,000 HP. Anything else that you get, whether it's energy recharge, elemental mastery, or crit rate crit damage, is all extra and doesn't substantially improve her core gameplay. Alright, I'm going to be discussing her constellations early because they do affect some of her less common build paths for artifact stats. In general, I find that Nilu's constellations to be well distributed in terms of strength increase and quality of life upgrades all the way to constellation 6, with some enticing incentives even just early on. However, as with all 5 star characters, these are pure luxury upgrades for those with deeper pockets or those with luckier summons. Constellation 1. Nilu's Sword Stance third hit gains a 65% damage increase. This is only the third multiplier here, responsible for about 40% of her total N3 damage. Now, this is only substantially noticeable for her on-field DPS playstyle and more prevalent in non-bloom-oriented comps. Second, Nilu's Aura Stance also gains 6 seconds, increasing it from 12 seconds to 18 seconds, allowing for a full 100% uptime of her 2-second Hydra application. This has the highest value in bloom-oriented compositions, effectively increasing her total blooms by 33% whether they're from the team or from her. This is assuming 100% bloom application uptime as well. Constellation 2. This enhances the effect of her A1 passive talent by also decreasing both Hydro and Dendro resistance by 35% under their respective conditions. This improves both her Aura and Sword Stance by benefiting Super Bloom and her own personal damage. You can view this constellation as a built-in 4-piece Viridescent for Hydro Shred and a 4-piece Deepwood for Dendro Shred in one constellation. It's her strongest general use early constellation. C3 and C5, Burst plus 3 levels and Elemental Skill plus 3 levels respectively. Constellation 4, her Burst Focus Constellation, not only improves her Burst uptime with flat energy return, but also increases its damage by 50%. Now both of these happen after the activation of either stance though, so this constellation maximizes the value of her Burst after a majority of either stance is finished. Constellation 6, Nilu gains both a crit rate and crit damage increase based off of her max HP, up to 30% crit rate and 60% crit damage capped at 50,000 HP. Interestingly enough, C6 ties in all of her previous constellations and makes her DPS on-field stance significantly more powerful without sacrificing her innate HP scalings or team-oriented buffs. Constellation 1's Luminous Illusion damage increase becomes a lot more meaningful with the built-in crit, and with the ICD of her Sword Stance rotation enabling this N3 hit to apply Hydro most of the time, if you do forward vaporizes with the Luminous Illusion, they can be maximized in terms of damage. Constellation 2's Hydro Shred gains a lot more value for her Hydro DPS in Hydro Dendro only teams as it acts like 4-piece Viridescent and in non-bloom team comps can stack with a 4-piece Viridescent user if added in. Constellation 4's Burst Damage now gains heightened strength by improving the efficacy of its 50% increased damage and potential for double vaporized damage. So, the main value of a max Constellation Nilu is her ability to flex as a powerful on-field carry with her other constellations gaining strength. Overall, I find her constellations to be quite nice upgrades at each stage. Lucky budget players will find Aura Stance 100% uptime to be quite nice for Hydro application, and if you're lucky, double Hydro Dendro Shred to improve DPS quite a bit, while the Whales will enjoy a crit boost from Constellation 6. Alright, now we can get into weapons and artifacts. So, holistically, Nilu has two distinctly defined playstyles determined by her elemental skill. She has Aura Stance, which is off-field, zero damage, and a reaction-focused ability. Hydra application happens at two-second intervals, and Elemental Burst is completely optional. Prioritizes pure HP, with optional Elemental Mastery for self-blooms, and optional Energy Recharge for burst uptime, with minimal to no use for crit rate or crit damage. Then we have Sword Stance. This is her on-field, Hydro-infused damage mixed multiplier and reaction ability. Hydra application occurs at 1.6. 6 second intervals and elemental burst is also completely optional. Prioritizes pure HP, optional crit rate crit damage for self infused hydro damage, optional energy recharge for burst uptime, and optional elemental mastery for occasional self blooms and non bloom vaporized damage. So I define these stances separately with their stat priorities since different weapons work better for each one. Now, Nilu is not restricted to either stance even within the same composition, so I'll include a third category for weapons that work in both stances so you can get a full visual of what works best where. Let's begin with that first, then split off to the specifics. So, optimal weapons for both stances. Obviously, her signature, Key of Kajna Suit, 
provides a massive HP percent for both the secondary and the passive, which is the only significant stat that matters in whichever build. Also, it has a 3 stack passive that is instantly proc'd in her transition dance state, providing both a self elemental mastery increase for self blooms or vaporizes, and a team elemental mastery increase for team blooms. At level 90, Nilu with R1 key can expect at least 60,000 HP, meaning its 3 stack passive will be providing at least 216 self EM and 120 team EM. Jade Cutter. This is the only other sword that provides HP present in some way, making it a viable choice in either stance playstyle. The additional crit rate stat stick makes it more enticing option for sword stance players. Sacrificial Sword. This is the only sword that enables both stances to exist simultaneously every rotation. Two uses of elemental skill per rotation also increases burst uptime reliability. Only use it R5 for maximum consistency and lowest cooldown. Alright, now onto optimal weapons for sword stance. So in Sword Stance, Nilu prioritizes number 1, pure HP, and then optional crit rate crit damage for self-infused hydro damage, optional energy recharge for burst up time, and optional elemental mastery for occasional self-blooms and non-blue vaporized damage. 5 stars, Miss Splitter. So this is used purely for her DPS. Crit damage and elemental damage bonus stat stick for her. The 3 stacks of the passive is not possible by herself, as her Sword Stance damage counts as elemental skill damage, so she's not able to get this normal attack deals elemental damage unless someone else infuses for her. Arun Futsu. So this is similar to the Miss Splitter. Instead, it's a pure crit rate and elemental damage stat stick. The normal attack damage passive is not useful for her. 4 star weapons, any of the recharged secondary weapons. Favonia Sword, you'll need minimal crit rate to activate the passive consistently. I would aim for 30% plus in Sword Stance for 2 average procs and a 15 normal attack rotation. Elemental Burst every rotation is fairly easy with this weapon, combining the secondary stat, energy recharge, and the passive orbs. Festering Desire. This is the free event weapon from 1.2, granting both elemental skill damage and elemental skill crit rate. Self-explanatory for Sword Stance. Now, optimal weapons for Aura Stance. So in Aura Stance, Nilu prioritizes number one, pure HP, and then optional elemental mastery for self blooms, and then optional energy recharge for burst uptime. Five stars, Freedom Swarm. This is the highest elemental mastery secondary stat out of any weapon, optimal for self blooms. The passive is quite situational, depending on whether they can utilize the attack percent and the normal charge plunger damage bonus. 4 star weapons, any elemental mastery related weapon. So we have Iron Sting, which is an elemental mastery stat stick. We have Alley Flash, which is the same thing, but weaker than Iron Sting. And then we have, which are not shown, Sapwood Blade for the energy recharge secondary stat with an elemental mastery passive, and the new Xyphos' Moonlight. So while the new Moonlight weapon can work for her aura stance, it is heavily unoptimized as it works best with a character that stacks pure elemental mastery, meaning 900 or above. Nilu will at most be achieving 300 plus elemental mastery with her triple HP build, gaining only 10 to 20% recharge depending on refinement and providing 3 to 6% recharge to her teammates. Now onto artifact setups which is probably the most convenient and easily accessible part of her kit. So for her own personal stack gain, there is currently no full 4-star set that provides universal value greater than a generic 2-piece 2-piece combo. There are specific 4-piece sets that can work under certain conditions. If you're running fully supportive Super Bloom Nilu, which is basically just her A1 passive, she can actually be the holder of 4-piece Deep Wood for the resistance shred. If you're running non-bloom vaporized Nilu, she can be the wielder of 4-piece Lava Walker set for increased damage against pyro-afflicted enemies. Now for 4-piece Tenacity, I would exercise Caution, as the true utility of the attack percent and shield strength is unused in a Super Bloom oriented comp. Besides those 4 pieces, most Nilus will likely be running any of these 2 piece sets. So we have Tenacity, which is 20% HP for both stances, Art of Depth for 15% Hydro for Sword Stance, Gilded or Wanderers for 80 EM for Aura Stance, and then we have Noblesse for 20% Burst, and Emblem for 20% Recharge for both stances. For these 2 piece sets, I would prioritize 2 piece Tenacity over all other 2 piece sets, and then aim for subsets that fit your type of playstyle. Now, how about main stat choices? So her flexibility here can be split up into a supportive and DPS build. At C0 to C1, most of you will be running a standard pure HP build that maximizes super bloom value. Because HP% percent double dips into both her multipliers and bloom core damage, hard to see, of her Ascension 4 passive, she doesn't really get impacted from diminishing returns like other characters. Though, this does have a soft cap of 74,000 HP for 400% bloom damage, this is only achieved with her signature weapon and high investment builds. For non-bloom DPS build, she can act as your standard HP scaling Hydro DPS. Depending on your subset optimization, her DPS build can be one of several options. Overall, these builds look like the following. 
If you're running pure HP, support of Nilu from C0 to C6, triple HP for maximized HP and optional burst uptime, or you can run energy recharge timepiece for guaranteed one burst per rotation, still maximizing HP. Then we have Hydro DPS Nilu from C0 to C5. This is just a standard HP timepiece, Hydro Goblet, and Crit Rate Crit Damage Mask. Then we have Hydro DPS Nilu if you're running C6, where you'll gain plus 30 crit rate and plus 60 crit damage if you're at 50,000 or higher HP. In these C6 builds, I'm going to assume that you have at least R1 key because it provides self-elemental mastery based on her HP. We have triple HP percent, which is the mixed DPS slash bloom build, utilizing just the crit rate crit damage from C6. Then we have HP timepiece, HP or Hydro Goblet, and the crit damage mask. This is a strictly DPS focused build. Then we have the super optimized R1 or higher key DPS build. HP timepiece, Hydro Goblet, and HP Mask. This is assuming really good crit substats and C6 to optimize her crit rate crit damage ratio. So these C6 build paths get highly specific depending on exactly what comp you're running and how many crit substats you have and refinement of the key for the elemental mastery game. Honestly, it's just me nerding out on C6 builds. At the end of the day, 99% of you will be running the standard triple HP build. Team Compositions So, by design, Nilu's A1 passive encourages you to run her with only Hydro and Dendro on the team for maximized Super Bloom damage. Currently, team setups involving only Hydro and Dendro are fairly restrictive. As Super Blooms are mostly AoE center damage, we're looking for as much AoE element application as possible. For Dendro, we only have two characters that fit this bill. Dendro MC and Kale. Pairing them together alongside a Hydro Healer to counteract the Bloom's self-damage, we have her standard design-based composition, Double Hydro plus Double Dendro. Reducing this composition to just a single Dendro support allows for guaranteed Bloom procs from the Dendro character, allowing for the highest Super Bloom damage, double dipping from both the Dendro character's Elemental Mastery and Nilo's Ascension 4 passive. For now, we just have Dendro MC that does this consistently. The extra Hydro will either be Xingqiu or Yellen for extra Hydro application and DPS. Both of these A1 focus compositions will usually have Nilu in Aura Stance most of the time. You'll be leading with Quadra E, activate A1 passive, and set up the team for Bloom damage. Now, what about non-Bloom team comps? So these team comps will be ignoring both her Ascension 1 and Ascension 4 passive, and be strictly relying on her fairly strong HP% percent multipliers. In these team comps, Nilu is primarily in Sword Stance as an on-field DPS enabler. We currently have two standardized team comps that work in this situation. Taser Nilu. Usually running double Hydro plus one Electro plus Kazuha, Nilu is a standard Hydro DPS carry in this stance, with Kazuha double buffing and shredding both Hydro and Electro. The solo Electro in this situation is either Fischl or Raiden Shogun, whose off-field elemental skills proc during Nilu's attacks. Unfortunately, Beidou does not have synergy with Nilu. Her attacks do not count as normal attacks, so Beidou's burst doesn't proc. The second Hydro is comfortably Xingqiu, as he will be the only source of minor healing with his Rain Swords. Second, Vape Nilu. This brings back the good old Kazuo Bennett Xiangling combo, which has super high pyro application to allow Nilu to forward vaporize. In Sword Stance with E into N3 by 6 combo, Nilu is able to vaporize on the first E and then all the N3s following the normal ICD rules. N3 is her Luminous Illusion Multiplier, which is her highest multiplier in Sword Stance. Nilu's Elemental Burst is also able to lead the rotation since her burst second wave hits 2.5 seconds after, allowing Bennett to burst in between and Kazuo to stop swirl hydro and pyro. After that, Xiangling is responsible for fast pyro application alongside Kazuo's burst that allow Nilu to forward vape. Beyond these compositions, Nilu is still able to find comfortable synergies in all other hydro related compositions. Hyperbloom, Virgin, and also their freeze related compositions. As much as she is designed to be a hydrodendro only super bloom enabler, I enjoy the flexibility of aura and sword stance that fit other comps. All right, time for a showcase of these compositions. Super Bloom Nilu will be running her signature key in pure aura stance for maximum bloom damage. Artifact setup will be two tenacity, two heart of depth, with triple HP main stat. Hydro DPS Nilu will be running Jade Cutter in pure sword stance for maximum hydro damage. Artifact setup still two tenacity, two heart of depth, with HP, hydro, and crit damage main stats. Cue the music, Mr. Cool. Oh, new punch.
And that covers everything you need to know about Nilu. I personally love her dual stance design and unique Super Bloom playstyle. She can either be an off-field Hydro Applier or an on-field Mixed DPS. For those with a less flexible roster though, she may be a little suffocating with the units she needs to shine. But with generally low investment builds, her Super Blooms can deal massive amounts of AoE damage in a short amount of time. And if you don't prefer this new Bloom playstyle, she can still act as a standard Hydro DPS enabler in our old-fashioned teams. If you made it to the end, don't forget to subscribe and maybe check out some of my other videos. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you next time. Take care.